<laughs> How's Buso going? You're settling in down there and feeling the groove? Yeah, yeah, it's great. Everyone's so active here. But, you know, it kind of reminds me of New Zealand because I got that vibe when I went to New Zealand that everyone was really, you know, active over there and it, like, didn't matter about the weather or anything. It was just everyone just, you know, get outside and, and do something for the day. So it's it's great. It's definitely my kind of place. Yeah, awesome. Well, it's a big change up from Perth, is it, do you feel? I don't know. I mean, Perth's pretty pretty small as well, really, yeah. relatively, I think. So it's just kind of like a dialed back version of Perth and uh, a few more wineries and uh, easier access to the beach. Yeah, cool. Have you got easy access to a pool, Kate? Are we going to yeah. see you donning the swimsuit and getting some laps in? Yes. Well, I actually signed up for the Busso Jetty Swim. So Ooh, if, you don't, yeah, if you don't know what that is, it's a swim around the Bustleton Jetty, which is the longest jetty in the Southern Hemisphere. Um, so it's a really old, iconic part of WA. So it just goes all the way out to the ocean. So 1.8 kilometers out. Wow. Um, so yeah, so we swim out and around that and back into shore. Ironman WA used to actually do the swim around that. When I did Ironman WA, that was the swim and it's super iconic, but they changed it. I can't help but feel like they changed it because there are sharks. Yeah. You know, it's top your way. A few. Um, yeah. So I've got that actually in a couple of weeks. So I have been hitting up some swimming and getting my open water swim on, which I do love. And I've done Rotto Solo before. So I so that's a 20K open water swim. So yep. I, I do really enjoy my swimming and strength training for swimming and everything swimming related. Yep. Yeah, that's a nice little segue you've done there for us, Kate, actually. Brilliant, because what we're going to chat about today, we thought we'd actually leap into a bit of the swimming side and chat shoulders yes. and chat shoulder strength, shoulder mobility, the combination of the two, and then that sort of relationship into swimming and cycling and, and bringing, bringing some of your knowledge to the table about pe how people can use the gym work, really, um, and other, other instruments that have to be in the gym to help improve that mobility and stability, which has a big impact on those two disciplines it's I, th I think it plays such a big role and I think there's just um you know so many components to swimming as well where it comes to the technique and then having the strength and if you make alterations to your technique do you have the strength to be able to handle that in swimming and you know the difference between open water swimming pool swimming like it's there's, there's so many factors but yeah I, I do love chatting about um particularly obviously strength training for swimming because and mobility they go hand in hand because it can be complex, but then we can also make it quite simple at the same time, really. And Bevan and I were actually talking this morning on the podcast um, about this was just simplicity. It's so important. Mm -hmm. I'm really just simplifying what you're doing, just focusing on a few key elements. And that's really key when I'm coaching swimming as well is how, how do I narrow the view so people are really just directing themselves on a couple of key things. And as you alluded to there, it's really important for me as a coach to think about how what can the swimmer manage? Where can they put themselves in the water? And therefore, what stroke can we apply? So it's not a, we're all going high elbow, we're all going a swing, we're all rotating from the hips. Because some people actually can't stabilize very well if they rotate right round to the side and through the hips and doesn't work for them. So they've got to keep the hips flatter and just make sure that rotation is really driven from the shoulders. So, you know, there's different approaches to take in there and that really relates back to what they can do in the gym and then we need to think about too, okay, if we want to achieve that in the pool, then what might we want to achieve in the gym to support that? So whether that's increasing the mobility through different dry lead exercises pre and post swim or alternatively in the gym on a regular basis too. And I, I think you and Bev have like nailed it again. It's that it's just keeping it, like you said, super simple. If you look into shoulder anatomy, it, it's quite complex. Um, but when you really take a step back and like you said, you just look at the athlete and their needs, just keeping those strength programs or mobility drills or, you know, your technique drills that you would do with your athletes, keeping it simple is definitely the way to go. And I think, and I know that we touch on this a bit, but you know, you can get so caught up on social media and YouTube and Instagram and see all these fancy, fancy kind of looking exercises and they might look like they're related to swimming because maybe they're doing something that replicates a form of the swim stroke. But if it's really, really over complex, odds are you probably don't need it. I think that sometimes people are really quick to slam, say, like a shoulder external rotation to strengthen up a couple of the muscles of the rotator cuff and they go, no, that's too simple. You know, we can do better. It's like, well, 
yes, you wouldn't do that in isolation for sure. Yep. That's not the only thing you're going to give your swimmer, but also you do need rotator cuff strength there. So there's nothing wrong with doing a shoulder external rotation. That's a really good bread and butter exercise. Uh, you want to progress it and you want to complement it with a couple of other ones, but you don't have to overcomplicate things. And um, I think the important thing is to say, Tim, like you were chatting about with Bevan and what you guys look at, what your athlete can do in the pool, and then having that nice team around you that works then with the strength coach or with the physio that they're working with to say, hey, look, I think this is their weaknesses or this is their strengths. Um, can we work on improving this aspect of mobility or this aspect of strength and putting them together and having that nice little cohesive team or the athlete being aware of what they need and being able to relay that is really important for them to get the most out of their strengthening and injury prevention for swimming for sure. Thing I think you touched on there was just talking about the rotator cuff and that really mm -hmm. relates into that shoulder girdle and having really good strength and stability around the shoulder girdle. Mm -hmm. And something I think a lot of people think of, uh, forget about, sorry, when they go to the gym is that posterior side. Yeah. And we all think anterior, which actually can limit us in some of our range yeah. as well. But if we can think posterior and think about that shoulder girdle specifically and the strength and stability there, yeah. um, that's going to help us. So if we get real mobile to try and get a nice long reach in our stroke, we're going to need to be stable around that shoulder girdle, and that scapula especially. And I thought maybe you could just throw out some ideas about your go-tos around how you create stability through that shoulder girdle and therefore what people might be looking for to have if they're really wanting a long, good reach in their stroke. So I'm going to get a little bit nerdy here. Love it. Because, <laughs> because you can't have a podcast with me without getting a little bit That's nerdy. Right. <laughs> when we think about shoulder joint anatomy, we always think of the shoulder joint because it's a ball and socket joint. So we think of it as ball and socket joint. If you're, if you're watching this in terms of like a YouTube video or Instagram, we think of it as the ball. If you put your hand together in a fist and the socket with your other hand being open over it. Or a lot of people might think of the hip joint and think that our shoulder joint is quite similar to that. And we go, oh, cool, ball and socket joint. It's nice and stable, but it's absolutely not a stable joint. But that's the point of it is that we don't well, it is stable, but we don't want it to be this really deep ball and socket joint. When you actually see the anatomy of the shoulder joint, it's more like this, like a ball being your fist and then it's your pinky that's the socket. So some people might liken that to a golf ball sitting on a tee, like that's a little bit of an exaggerated version, but actually not too much because the head of the humerus is about three times bigger than the fossa. So it's not this really deep joint that we may initially think of it as so you've got your rotator cuff muscles like what you touched on there and they are your subscapularis so that's at the front that does internal rotation so it will pull if you're standing there with your elbow bent to 90 degrees and you would bring your hand in towards your chest that's internal rotation that's your subscap and then you've got on the back of you, your infraspinatus and your teres minor, they do external rotation. And then you have your supraspinatus, which is also on your back and your scapula. That sits above the spine of the scap, so the top of your scapula or your shoulder blade. And that does a little bit of abduction um, as well into more of your scaption plane. So they are your rotator cuff muscles. So there's four of them. But when they work together nicely and they have adequate strength, what they actually do because of the way that they insert onto the shoulder is they really help stabilise the head of the humerus in your shoulder joint and they help stabilise that to prevent it from going too excessively high and coming up and rotating and sort of pushing on the underneath of the shoulder joint. So that can help prevent things like bursitis um, and tendonitis through there and tendinopathies. So like I said, strengthening them is really important. So you not only need to strengthen the rotator cuff muscles, but the other part of your shoulder joint, like we were talking about, is that fossa or that, um, you know, the socket part of your shoulder. And that's a part of your scapula, so a part of your shoulder blade. And you also need to strengthen up the muscles that originate and insert on the shoulder blade to create, you know, the other half of stability there. So you not only need to work the rotator cuff, but also those muscles that originate and insert on the scapula. So I'll sort of break down like strengthening, let's say, the external uh, rotators and some of the rotator cuff muscles first. Like we touched on before, doing some really simple shoulder external rotations is a really good place to start. 
And I absolutely think they have their place in all swimmers and triathletes programs. And you can progress these. That's really nice. So you might say you want to start and do a sideline shoulder external rotation. So that would literally just be lying on your side um, with your elbow virtually sitting on your hip. And I'll post some of these videos on our social media as well. Um, and you are slowly controlling a dumbbell up and down with your elbow bent to 90 degrees. But funnily enough, I see these kind of done not as effectively as they could be. So I see people bending their um, or using their biceps and bringing their hand up more towards their face as they get tired and fatigued because, of course, that shortens the lever arm, so it makes it easier. Or when they get tired, they tend to use their wrist and come into excessive wrist extension flexion. Then they're just kind of working their wrist extensions <laughs> and flexes and I'm like, oh, I don't quite think that's the point. Um so that's a really good one to start. And then as people feel like they can progress, they can then start to do that on a cable machine or they can do it in standing with their arm, out, ugh, with their arm abducted to 90 degrees and doing that shoulder internal rotation, external rotation, they're nice and controlled. And that's a really nice progression. And then you can start to bring it up overhead as well because that's obviously a lot more swimming specific. So, and you can do that, like I said, with dumbbells, with a cable machine, or with a band. If you're doing it, you know, poolside before or after your swim, like you said, or if you're just doing it home, you just have a band. I think that they're still fantastic. They're really good. But you also don't want to forget about the upper rotator cuff muscles. So that's probably what I see people do incorrectly too, is they might just focus on external rotation. So doing some internal rotation, which you can actually work in the same movement. So you can just do those movements in a really controlled manner or just focus really on that internal rotation. Or if you were setting up on the cable machine, just literally turn around and face the other way and do that with the internal rotation is really helpful as well. Um, and then to get that supraspinatus, some, I call them super flies. I don't know if that's uh, their official name, but I've got all sorts of names for, for exercise. They kind of vary depending what mood I'm in. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah. Same with swim coaching. I didn't hear that drill before. Oh, yeah, sorry. I was meaning that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And sometimes I just show people and they're like, oh, that one. I'm like, yeah, yeah. yeah, what did I call it last week? Um, but these would just be holding onto dumbbells, holding them by your side, and then just controlling them up in a plane that feels natural to you. And that's our scaption plane. So it's not quite abduction. It's not quite flexion. Um, but doing that will help target the supraspinatus as well. So having a combination of those, um, can be really, really helpful exercises to work on the rotator cuff. And again, super simple, like really, really simple kind of movements. And you will also work your rotator cuff in some bigger global movements as well. But there's some good ways to isolate that and strengthen that up if you feel like you're particularly lacking strength through there. Yeah. And so, Kate, I mean, you talked about, you touched on it there, sort of bursitis mm. and shoulder pain, quite common in swimmers. And more so, I see it common in high elbow swimmers. So just seeing mm. you're really pinchy in there. Yeah. So obviously, you what you're explaining there is a really good even rehab program potentially out of the back of some shoulder pain as well and that's yeah. going to help relieve it yeah absolutely and I find definitely like what you said in the high real high elbow swimmers and the ones that are notorious for bringing their hand and crossing over to the midline and the ones entering some first. first um yeah because what that does is it brings your shoulder into that internal rotation and that will rotate and can impinge on the tendon there and then you can get secondary bursitis which is generally more that way around um, and that can really cause that pain so they are definitely really good ones but I wouldn't do those alone I would also include strengthening of muscles that play a role in stabilizing the scapula as well because it's really important because you want the ball and the socket to work together in movement so you want them to move you know really nice and congruently with each other so I would also include some movements such as a bent over row um, like you were saying perfect Tim about strengthening up the muscles on the posterior of us so that really helps strengthen up through your rhomboids so the muscles that go from the inside border of your scapula or your shoulder blade then they go to the spine so they help pull those shoulder blades back and together and can help open up through there they're really good so some barbell bent over rows or kettlebell bell single arm bent over rows I find they're good if you've got big discrepancies side to side um scapular push-ups are one of my absolutely favorite yeah, nice. ones yeah because they work that serratus anterior which is yeah. the only muscle that goes from the scapula to the thoracic area so for anyone listening um and I think I, I can't remember if I've 
sort of said this a lot, but the way I explain serratus anterior is if you're watching boxes and they have that really nice fan-shaped muscle, really nice, I say that. I don't know, too many people say Probably not, but I'll run with you with all that. Nice. I mean, like, I look at it from an anatomy perspective. Yeah. Like, wow, look at that cool look muscle. Look strong they are. That's it. Yeah, that's yeah. exactly what I think. Um, <laughs> but that is a really important stabilizing muscle for anyone that uses their shoulders, not just swimmers. Um, but I always include that in there. Um, and then a form of lower trap um, exercise as well, because that plays an important role in helping stabilize the scapula. Uh, so I would always complement, I would always sort of make sure the program's about 50% rotator cuff, 50% muscles that play a role on the scapula. Yeah, nice. And so you got that program that's strengthening, we're stabilizing with that. It's creating a really good platform for us. But yet in swimming and even for a TT position, we're thinking about mobility. You know, mm. having, you know, we're seeing the elbows getting closer together now in a TT position. Mm. How can you sit in? Do you have the mobility to hold that shape? Can you hold it for 90, 180K? And yeah. then also we think we, we see in swimming, we've got impacts on your reach. We've got impacts on your rotation. We've got impacts on your breathing coordination. If you yeah. don't have that range in mobility, especially that tension that can come through the neck. Yeah. Um, and the ability to catch because if you're out here in front, I'm demonstrating like everybody's watching a video of us do it, but you're out here in front, you know, you've got to have that mobility through your shoulder. You've got to put your hand in the right place to get that power towards your feet really, really quick. So how do you build in that mobility work for um, patients or clients um, or athletes into that gym program as well? Yeah, this is such a good question. Um, So first of all, I think that it is completely athlete dependent. So I've had... Um, a lot of online consults with people who say I need to work on my mobility and I ask them to go through some movements and they actually don't have any restriction at all. Um, So I find that people with a history, you know, if they've swum before a water polo or any kind of overhead sports, often that's there more than enough. They just might need some technique tweaks or they might need a little bit more strengthening rather than mobility work. But then I also see a lot of In particular, this is probably in triathletes that have come from, say, like a rugby background uh, or an AFL background or a really big just sort of gym background where they might have really big deltoids, um, really tight through the lats, for example, and then they're definitely quite restricted. So I always try to tie in the mobility work with strengthening. So that means that I wouldn't prescribe static stretches. Um, and this is because generally your research shows that doing dynamic movements like strengthening, and it doesn't have to be heavy, just a form of strengthening, can improve fascicle length. So that can actually improve the muscle length. And it also really helps improve. And this is all a little bit hypothesized as exactly how it helps improve it. But one of the big theories is something called reciprocal inhibition. So what that means is that sometimes we get really tight through this mobility through our shoulders, or wherever it is, is because the antagonist, so the opposite muscle, is overactive and it's working a lot. So reciprocal inhibition simply means you strengthen up these muscles. So let's say that you are, um, let's say you want to work your triceps, okay, during swimming and you want to extend and you want to get a really nice powerful pull. You then need to strengthen up your triceps and your biceps and strength training because when your triceps are working, you don't want your biceps to be active because they will restrict the range that you can do that pull. So strength training can help improve reciprocal inhibition, which means that the agonist and antagonist, so the working and the opposite muscle, can work really nicely together so they allow full range of motion. Um, And another proposed factor as to why people will generally get really tight through the area is because they are weak as well. So strengthening that up can help improve that. So I would do movements through full range. So I would do exercises such as um, I call them a lat hang. Some people call them a scapula hang. So, you know, that hanging Yep. Really hanging hands. My name's a dead hang for that. Oh, I love a dead I hang. Love them. Yeah, I, I wish people could see us right now, Tim. Yeah. <laughs> but you know, hanging hands up and then bringing your shoulder blades together and then relaxing out of that is such a good strengthening exercise for those muscles that play a role on the shoulder blades. But also, it's a really nice mobility one through the lats as well. So that can replace something like your kneeling overhead stretch that you might see a lot of people do. Um, That's a really nice way to improve strength but improve mobility at the same time. Um, 
any obviously overhead movement. So I think another great one is laying down on your tummy. You can pop a towel underneath your head. Actually, you don't even have to do these weighted, but you could grab, say, one kilo or 1.25 kilo weights and laying on your tummy and then coming with your shoulders up with your hands all the way by your shoulders, then controlling them nice and slowly up overhead and then controlling them back down again. And that will create really nice strength from those rhomboids on the back of you, but also through that range, really help open up through those lats as well, where people might traditionally feel that weakness through there. Um, that's another really, really good option. And the other really nice one to help open up, particularly through the, the chest, because like you touched on, Tim, was like, you know, being, say, TT position for a long mm-hmm. time. So if you're a triathlete, is one that I call, again, who knows what this name is, but a, overhead, a bench overhead dowel movement. So you're just laying on your back on a bench with your head up towards the edge of the bench. You've got a dowel, you thread a weight through it, so like a little weight plate, like a 1.25 or 2.5 kilo. If you want to work your abs at the same time, which I like doing, this is just bringing your knees up and your feet up off the bench. Straight away, you get some ab activation and you're lowering that dowel up over your head and the weight through that dowel is pulling you down um, and you're getting a great stretch through your lats, but you're also getting some really good shoulder strengthening at the same time. And that one's nice because you can objectively see an improvement in the range of where the dowel goes. And I find that's probably one of the best all-rounders for swimmers and triathletes because they get core strengthening, shoulder strengthening and huge mobility gains. And it's really nice to open up through the chest to counteract what you do in swimming and in TT position. Yeah, I'll, I love, I'll put some videos up because it's yeah, probably do, cause, Yeah, but I love that Dow one as well. Anything where I feel like I'm getting some sort of active range and mobility yeah. through, so the dead hang's great. And I throw yeah. in some knee raises with that too if I'm running really yeah. nasty. But then yeah, the Dow well, one's fantastic. <laughs> Oh, just, just. <laughs> the Dow one's awesome as well, just getting over top. And as you say, you can start to get some really good feedback through there. What would mm. be your tip to people with the queuing of the core for that one? Like, Do you let people's backs go? Do you want it locked down? How do you work yeah, the exercise? I generally try and say not too much more than if you were to put your hand um, in that yep. gap as well. So, you know, again, it comes down to if you're sort of letting that happen, that extra range is coming from lumbar lordosis mm, or an exactly. arch in the back. Yeah, rather than your shoulders. Yeah. So with that one, I would say it's great to get your core muscles working. Um, so like I said, bring your knees and your feet off the bench and keep them bent to 90, 90 degrees each. But then let the core and stuff sort of do its thing naturally because it's not the point of that one. The point of this one is upper body mobility and strength. So focus on that. And when you're being honest with yourself and you go, oh, no, that's my range, come back up again rather than letting it be too excessive through the bag. So I would say if you can pop your hand in, that's probably the maximal amount that you would really want that bend to be um, and then focus just more on that kind of range and then slowly build up from there. Yeah, nice. Nice, Kate. And I think one thing I think I'm picking up here, and and it's what I've seen more so when I'm coaching as well, is that most of the shoulder issues that we're getting are from a lack of strength and mobility. Yeah. You know, a little bit of technique work played in there that we can adapt around. But, you know, the strength and mobility is such a massive one. Um, And, you know, obviously there's going to be elements of overload that come in. So if you haven't got the strength and mobility, then you overload with too much volume. It's going to exacerbate the problem earlier on. Versus if you're on lower volume, it might come over later with chronic loading and time. Yeah. Um, so really for a lot of people, what they should really be focusing on for swimming performance, in my mind, and I feel you'll be exactly the same too, is actually the strength and mobility stuff is just critical. Um, yeah. And for Australians and Kiwis that do a lot of wetsuit swimming as well, you got to be strong because you're going to resist a wetsuit too. Exactly. And, you know, I was actually going to say, Tim, on that, that lack of strength, I actually do find that with wetsuit swimmers um, and in particular open water swimming, there's a lot of coming out of the water to sight. Mm. Um, and in a wetsuit too, it completely changes your body position compared to swimming in the water. So naturally a lot of people are going to have their back end obviously lifted up, which is what a lot of people love. Their feet don't drag as much. Yeah. But that actually creates lumbar lordosis so a curve through there and then if you have that and then you're trying to add in sighting so you know you're taking a stroke and you're looking up and coming to a lot of extension and then back down or you might be breathing more to one side than the other because of the chop or the sun in your face or you know whatever's going on 
I, I actually find people often forget those demands. So some back extension work is also really good to help tolerate, like you said, the, the load through there. It's one thing, you know, to go out and do it all. But if you don't have that strength there, it can take a toll. And I find actually a lot of people then feel this on the bike. If mm. they're triathletes, they'll say, I don't get back pain on the bike when I'm in training, but every race I tend to, and now go, have you done the distance yet? And try and figure out. And then I said, did you have a wetsuit? They go, yeah. I'm like, ah, do you do a lot of open water swimming? No. I actually think that it was your swim that may have led to a little bit of overuse through the back extensors and particularly through the thoracic area coming up and sighting. So I think that adding in um, some exercises like a glute hamstring raise, um, a bent over row, like I was saying, with um, a barbell and strengthening up through that thoracic area and getting that mobility as well through there and being able to come into that extension is important for open water swimmers. Um, yeah. And I think that's not really focused on a lot as well. So I would always complement some programs with that too, but it's, you know, I don't actually know if there's any research to support that out there. I don't think it's really been looked at. Um, but from my experience, I have definitely seen that a lot in triathletes. Yeah, I've heard that before. And one drill that we use a little bit in the pool is actually pool boy at the ankle. So pool boy and bands at the ankle. And yeah. you create that lordosis um, and you force a lot of core awareness as well. Yeah, um, and, that's and it's, great. And then people really have to stabilise through and try and hold their core and activate the whole time. And my one of the key go-to cues for me is body for balance, arms and legs for power. So it, it has a twofold effect in stimulating trying to create body balance, but also in the same time, as you talked about, thinking about how we swim in a wetsuit, feet are so much higher than we used to. We don't kick much, mm. and that's a position we're going to have to work in. And so you can throw some sighting drills in that as well. Yeah. You know, create some specificity without being in a wetsuit and without being in the open water or being a lobster in a pool and roasting <laughs> in your wetsuit, which a few of the guys here have had to do through winters. Um, it's a bit nice. brutal. Yeah. Nice. I like that uh, the arms and legs for power because that's also like the, the strength training. Even with those rotator cuff exercises and some of the simple stuff, you don't even have to go heavy. They're going to help you improve yeah. your swim power and the power of your pool because you generate that force and the power through the bigger muscles, but they have to go through a stable base to transfer that into an effective pool. And that's only going to happen if you have that stability there. So while mobility is important, you need that stability there as well. Yeah, exactly. You can't apply power without stability. It's just a given, right? And um, and I think that's something that I think we don't think about them as much in the gym. We're in there thinking about strength and power rather yeah. than how you create that stability. Yeah. Um, and you often see people doing the stability exercises and they're just sort of flapping their arm about like, oh, yeah, whatever physio. Yeah. <laughs> it's not going to yeah. make a huge okay. difference. But uh, you can be – exactly, yeah, just yeah, being... having a chat. <laughs> <laughs> and the important thing – Actually, Tim, I'm just going to pause this for a sec because yep. well, I'll keep this recording. Chris can edit it out because someone's just decided to yep. power wash something next door. And I'm just going to shut the door. Hang on, Tim. Classic. Sorry. How's that for like? And they're power washing it. It's got all over my washing as well. Oh, awesome. Thanks, guys. <laughs> Devastating. But, um, okay. Back to it. What, um, with the, you know, you were talking about the bands and just sort of people going, la, 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 maybe not yep. paying much attention to what they're doing. I've heard of um, someone doing 99 repetitions of the, the banded exercise before and I just want to point out, you know, this isn't saying anything bad about them because they're just doing literally what they're told and in a way I was quite impressed actually. Mm. Um, but with that kind of work, it's really important to know that if you were doing it, say, to work on your muscular endurance, no more than 15 repetitions. You just don't need more than that. And if you feel like you could, you know, very easily do a lot more than that, like if you feel like, gosh, I could do 99 at this, just go for a thicker band um, or progress it on the cable machine or get some heavier dumbbells because that 15 repetitions is the absolute maximum that you really want to do for muscular endurance. And don't be afraid to mix up the sets and reps because even though they're smaller kind of exercises, you can still do them in the maximal strength training parameters so you do want to load up the tendons appropriately there um you know because that, that's really important um so make sure that 
if you are doing them, do everything with a purpose. Make sure you know why you're doing that exercise, how it's going to translate over to, you know, say the drills then, Tim, that you would give them in the pool or the sessions that they're doing or things you've identified as a weakness and make sure that each one has a purpose and they're in the right set and rep range as well is really important too because I find a lot of people make the time, the effort to go and do their strength training and do some mobility work but they don't get out of it what they would ideally like or kind of deserve for putting in that time and effort just because they've not quite fine-tuned enough yeah yeah completely it's just it is fine tuning isn't it and it's just trying to figure out those few little pieces that work for you and then maximizing your time yes um, and that's a key one too is like a lot of us have 30 minutes you yeah know, we want to we want to maximize that window in the gym yeah um, and then translate it into a bit of age group performance or elite performance depending mm-hmm. on which way you're going yeah um, definitely yeah. yeah and you can get a lot done in 30 minutes you can yeah 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 Not that I actually, you need I really, it's you right you can yeah and I actually really enjoy the 30 minutes is about my happy place too I find if I go over that in the gym I start to get a bit stale after time yeah yeah Yeah. I think that's most most endurance athletes (laughs) okay that's been awesome thanks heaps for your time today been wicked to catch up again it's been a little bit of time had a good had a good Christmas and New Year's in between and uh you know, for everybody out there listening, you can dial into the Lee app as well to get some more of this information from Kate, um, have a one-on-one or just look into a program and see the information they're providing, which is epic. So thanks again, Kate, and have a wicked week. Thanks, Tim. You too.